Okay. So um, did you grab your, your energy drink, your coffee? You're all set. You're all ready for the next hour and a few minutes? I've had my chocolate. Excellent. Okay, I'll be drink, I'll sipping some of my coffee as we as we go along here. Okay, so this is part two of our interview with Ken Urquhart. Um, how do you how do you say it properly in Scottish again? Urquhart. Yeah, I can't I can't do it that well. <laughs> all right. So in in all of our hullabaloo last time of our technical matters and things like that, trying to get your video, um, I totally forgot to ask some of the basics. Uh, and I'm sure people would be curious of. So we're going to backtrack a little bit. Um, and just, can you just tell us right now, what is your current case and training level? Okay. Case, I really don't know. I was on Orders and Knots when I left the Sea Org in 1982. And uh, I continued, I had a little more Orders and Knots after that, when I, I think it was in Santa Barbara when I was working with David Mayo. And then he said, oh, just go and do it solo. So I just did what I knew already and did it on myself. I didn't do the solo knots course. Okay. And I never, I never did the solo knots that was issued as OT7 or Seven. whatever. Seven. Yeah. Right. So, and I just continued that, that over a period of years doing it fairly sporadically just as I thought about it. I would come to a win and then you know take a break and I'd just take a break until it occurred to me one day, well I I could go back in session. So I did various I did all the steps and I did various other things that occurred to me. And finally I just got when I got to the point, first of all I felt I'd done all the work I could do with that. And secondly I just, the inside of my skull felt so scraped. It was sore. <laughs> it reminded, you were me, <laughs> reminded me of my, my childhood days. My grandfather had a dinghy, a little wooden rowing boat. And every autumn he'd pull it up into the garden and he'd scrape it with a, a tool that had three three edges. It was for scraping the varnish. And he scraped the varnish and put fresh varnish on. Well, anyway, that's how I felt my my skull was inside. Scraped. <laughs> so I haven't done any serious auditing since. What what year was that, if I might ask? Oh, that would have been the last time I did it. Probably. It might, might be 10 years ago. Okay. Okay. So somewhere in the OT7 solo knots range is where you are officially per the, we're going to go by a great chart. Okay. I guess so. Yeah. Okay. I don't care. I don't care. Okay. So you never were curious to do OT8 or anything like that? No. no. I saw something of an OT8 that was said to be LRHs and I looked at it and I, I just wasn't terribly interested. Gotcha. Have you seen that anywhere in the field, or was that like an official church issue only? It they... was, I, it, I think it was supposed to be a copy of a church issue. Okay. But I, I have no way of verifying it, so. Okay. All right. And then on the trading side, where are you? <laughs> According to the church, I'm a class in class nine okay. and that that's somebody who's done at least class four and the knots auditor training and i can say that when i was auditing at flag i did so many checkouts on different actions i also got class five gotcha we didn't do the briefing course nor eight no it's a it's a class nine because you can audit knots. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. And I th as far as I'm concerned, it was an OT ploy on the church's part to satisfy the people who were paying them huge amounts of money, because the the public could say, "Well, you're just giving me a class four or a class five. Right. 
Right. So th then the auditors all could be listed as class nine. <laughs> and that sounds so much better. It sounds like you did the briefing course in class eight. That's what it sounds like. Oh, what I thought it was. Absolutely. But... Yeah. Jeez. And in fact, people were, many years ago, people were saying publicly you know, that Urquhart was a class nine. And I kept saying, no, I'm not. I never, I didn't do class nine. <laughs> I'm class five at the most. And then Pierre told me, Pierre Etier. Etier, okay. Told me about the, the what Flag had done. About class nine. Incredible. Class That's wild. This is the kind of stuff that drives me nuts. <laughs> it just does it, why? What is the I mean, I understand I understand why. I'm not naive or stupid. But I'm like, we're supposed to be beyond and above this kind of trickery and chicanery and it just makes us look as corrupt and as stupid as any other organization, honestly. Absolutely. We're no better. We're no better. No, no, no better. better. No. Unbelievably. Okay. Um, so do you have any plans to continue, or are you pretty much done with your bridge as of this lifetime, and you're just happy as, as, as where you're at, and you're just going to live life? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, yeah. No, I've got no plans for auditing. I do meditation. I enjoy that. My only, well, let's put it this way. I feel confident that when I have to leave this body, I'll be, of course, I don't know what's going to happen. Okay. But I think I'll be in a situation where nobody will be fooling about with me. I'll be smart enough and aware enough to know if that's happening. And perhaps strong enough to hit back if that's necessary. But uh, I'm, hope I'm hoping that I'll be able to graduate from the Earth path. Gotcha. So you're not terribly concerned with between lives area or getting reimplanted, resent, or whatever you think that you're actually at a level of awareness that you can avoid that at this point. Well, I'm not supposing I can avoid it. I'm not supposing that it, I won't find myself tempted. And I'm hoping I'm not stupid enough to make myself vulnerable by thinking I'm that clever. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me get back to the questions here, my formal questions. <clears throat> They're on my phone and it locks up, so here we go. All right. Okay. Speaking of, you, you mentioned meditation, so that brings me to a... <laughs> If you were a question, which is, do you think there are other religious philosophies or spiritual practices that are valid and helpful? Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about that. What, do, what have you found to be um, of value? Personally? Well, in principle, in principle, I think that there have been many, many very wise and smart people who've lived on this planet over the millennia, at least over thousands of years, I should say, who have left their thoughts and words behind. We talked about that in our first interview, actually. We mentioned um, some of yes. that. Yes, but there, I mean, we've mentioned we, specifically the Buddha and Christ, but there are many, many, many more. If you read... I mean, I haven't read all of the Upanishads, for example, which are even older than than the Buddha's writing, Buddha, well, the Buddha's teaching. Mm -hmm. And there's tons of stuff in there that's very enlightening. And again, you can read somebody like uh, Von Rilke, the Danish poet. He has some... Um, very beautiful and very clear, insightful verses. 
the, the world is full of wisdom. Yeah. Absolutely full of wisdom. Yeah. And in the early days, the books, um, I forget which book in particular, maybe it was um, The Fundamentals of Thought or one of the early Dynamics books. Uh, they had a preface where LRH acknowledged this body of philosophy that he you know, validated and got to pull stuff from. Yeah, yeah. he and did that in, uh, that was in Science of Survival, wasn't it? I, I believe so. One of the early books. And that's yeah, gone. Yeah. That's gone. That's gone. It's all now yeah. only LRH, which I think is a huge mistake. Um, Because there's, I mean, if you were to listen to the church, they would say, you would think that civilization just started and it's because of <laughs> LRH. Like, the, the, we've been a going concern for a while now. So there's obviously a lot of right, rightness in, in our, in our, in our past. Um, yeah. So don't discount that because there's obviously things of value yeah. in there. Uh, as far as meditation, uh, do you practice transcendental meditation, any specific thing, or to just kind of clear your mind? Can you describe how, how you do that? I don't really know. There's one form of meditation that I find very helpful, and that's called passage meditation. And that that was taught by Eknath Iswaran. Okay. And that, if, if you look up Blue Mountain center i think it is you'll find it uh, he he said that what you could do is to learn by heart a passage uh, that has been honored down the centuries as having been been w valuable wisdom you learn it by heart and you sit and you you go over the words slowly and you let them, you let them, the the intention or the meaning of the concept sink down into you. And of course, your attention will wander. You just bring it back. Sure. If, you know, you, you bring it back to the the beginning of the passage or the beginning of the verse that you went away from. And if it goes away too long, you go back right back to the beginning of the passage. So I find that very useful. I like that. Sounds and then there, there's uh, Osho has many different methods of meditation. I love Osho. He's he's a very very wise man, very kind man. Uh, and there's a thing that they call self hypnosis, which is really just part of what meditation is. You just go to a certain level where you can be aware of yourself at a deeper level. So I but I do, I, I wouldn't necessarily push either of those as the best method or the best method for any particular person. You have to find out what works best for you. Choice, individual choice. Um yeah. and how would the how would those compare with auditing if you were like just apples to apples try to compare them? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> auditing is very directed. Right. And it, it's actually a guided, in my opinion, it's a guided meditation. Sure. The auditor guides the, the attention of the person who is in session and who is actually meditating on himself or herself. But it's very, very targeted and it goes or what you might call barriers that are common to most people mm. and helps the people clear those barriers. Mm. I think it's very valuable, very, very valuable addition to the, <coughs> excuse me, the toolbox. I mean, it's the most, I think it's the most valuable addition to the toolbox that there has been for perhaps ever on sure. earth wow that is that is a deep statement because uh, you're not a person who's who's simply experienced auditing you've also experienced other things 
So, and you yeah. obviously lived a, a long life where you've seen, you have a breadth of experience. So that has, that carries weight, that carries weight and value that you would say that mm-hmm. has, has, has that. So for more people that are out there that might, I mean, this, this video is intended mostly for Scientologists because we're, t- we're, we're not holding back on talking Scientology really. But somebody who might say, hey, you know, I've heard about this guy and I understand he's he's meditated. I want to, maybe they found this video through that. Um, there's, even if you do meditation, if you, if you do whatever other practice, there's still a specific value in auditing, which you might not find elsewhere. So add it to the toolbox. That, that yeah. Is, yeah. Great, great, great yeah. point. Now, I, I don't remember it exactly, but I do remember seeing somewhere, and I think it was in Science of Survival, where he said that any any method you have for getting yourself or someone else up the time scale is valid. Yeah. Uh, he he uh, said that in a few places. Anything right. yeah, which rises in tone is, is a valid therapy. But of course you have, even, even in book one, he mentions the four valid therapies of education, change of environment, processing, and I forget the other one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Nutrition, maybe I don't remember. Um, so yeah, it's part of the tools. It's part of yeah. the tools. So let's not be closed-minded as people and say, "Oh, you know, now he's doing hot yoga. He's a squirrel." It's like, no, he's just doing hot yoga. <laughs> he's not saying. Well, he shouldn't be saying, "Hey, this is the tech that's going to bring you to OT." He's just doing hot yoga and shouldn't be crucified for. Her. Right. Oh, yeah. I would, as a, an ex-auditor, I would caution against doing auditing and something else at the same time. Correct. Correct. And that there's technical reasons for that. Especially yeah. since you're not going to know where yeah. change is going to be coming from or what turns something on if you're mixing. So you want to keep those yeah. separate. Yeah. And I would also say if, if, you're, if you're doing meditation and not being audited, but going to be having some auditing at some later time, just watch out because you might be meditating yourself into an area of trouble. It's possible. Thank you for that warning. Yes. There is trouble waiting for you. Yes. Um, And there are some specific types of, I think even uh, the Kundalini Yoga where a lot of pictures turn on facsimiles, and if you're, especially if you're not clear, I can imagine the confusion of stuff. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> of stuff. So be cautious. I think actually, uh, meditation is probably better left to clear and above, <laughs> or OT three and above, probably, to see you're a little bit more in control of all that kind of stuff. Interesting point. Very interesting point. And then, passage, I, passage meditation is probably safe for anybody. You would say it's safe for everybody. They yeah. are. Which one? Passage meditation. Passage. Sure, because you're not, yeah. You're not dull, like Kundalini yoga is almost a psychedelic experience where it's an uncontrolled running off of facsimiles and emotions. Yeah. Like, we don't want to go there, people. No. Uh, but something where you're uh, gentle, almost like a mantra. We're repeating a mantra. So yes, it resonates with you. It should generally be safe. So again, even within the spectrum of uh, meditation, there's there's good and there's better, like like you just yes. said. Well, thank you for clarifying that, because uh, I'm sure the first reaction of a lot of Scientologists looking at this, at this would be like, "What are you talking about meditation? Oh my god, no!" But uh, I think you just made a very good point of there's different kinds and not necessarily all of them should be practiced, but but your passage meditation sounds reasonably good, as long as you don't mix it with your auditing. <clears throat> you have several caveats. Okay, speaking of all this world of of uh, you know religion, spirituality, and mysticism, have you ever witnessed anything in Scientology specifically, or maybe outside of Scientology, that can only be attributed to the so-called OT abilities or something clearly supernatural. Yeah. Okay, can you describe that? Uh, there are a few, actually. The, the earliest one I remember was uh, I was a, 
a child living with my grandparents in a little village in Scotland on the water. Opposite the village was a, a large island and the, it was, the island was hilly and the side of the island that we faced was uninhabited. The only sign of human action was the telegraph pole. A cable came down through the water or under the water over to the mainland. And there was a there was a point where the the island was fairly close to the mainland and looking from the mainland across that water there was a little scene. And it consisted of a stream, which we called a burn, a burn which came down the hill and it formed a tiny valley. And the hill was mostly rock and fern. And just beside the stream, there were small trees growing. And they, of course, they got larger as the stream got larger and came down. And it ended in a little kind of meadow. And then the stream emptied into the sea. And for some reason, I found that particular view enchantingly beautiful. And this is in a, a, a spot in Scotland that many people, or at least some people, say is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Mm. I would look across at that spot, and it would, it, aesthetically, it was just perfect. It was absolutely beautiful and perfect. And I was very aware that no human hand had had anything to do with that perfection. And as I looked at it, I began to feel that connected with that scene was an enormous serenity far away in another dimension. Mm -hmm. That was one thing. Another time, I was, I was out in the little dinghy on a summer afternoon. For some reason, I was out on my own. Usually, I was out with one or two buddies. But this day, we were, I was on my own. It was in the early afternoon. It was very hot. It was very still, there was no wind. And I got very warm, so I stopped rowing. And I happened to be looking towards the village, which was mostly a road along the shore with some houses along the road and a few houses up in the hill. It was very, very quiet. If we saw three or four cars on that road any one day, we wondered what the hell was going on. And this was in the middle of the war. Mm. There weren't very many young people around. Anyway, I was sitting in the boat. The water was very still. And I'm suddenly aware of how warm I am, how, how the sun is warm on my back. And then I'm aware of how the sun must be equally warm on the hills that I'm looking at. And on all the, the trees, the ferns, the heather, the rocks, the houses and the gardens, and all the insects and the birds, we're all warm under the sun. And I suddenly felt that all of these natural things that I was looking at, they were we were all together happy in the sun, in the light and warmth of the sun. And at the same time, I became very aware that there wasn't a single human being in sight. It wasn't a busy village, but normally you would see somebody in the garden or walking along the road or bicycling, but there was nobody. And I realized that this happiness that I was looking at and experiencing had nothing to do with humanity. Mm and existed entirely independent of humanity. And humanity seemed to be unaware of it. 
Interesting. But it didn't matter to that happiness. Right. Um, then... How, how old have you had uh, these uh, uh, cognitions? I lived in Scotland from the age of just before four until I was seven or eight. Okay, so you're pretty young having these pretty aware experiences. Because yeah. most of these are, you know, or adults, yeah. whatever. <laughs> well, I can tell you, speaking about that, that uh, I was, my mother took me up there to her father and stepmother's house. My two older brothers were already there. This was in 1942. She was sick. The air raids were pretty bad by 1942, which is why, one reason why the boys were sent up. And later in that year, she'd had enough and she took me up and she left me. Well, she stayed with us there for a little while. Then she left. I don't remember her leaving. She left to go into um sanatorium not far away and we never saw her again wow and the the adults of course had to handle my brothers and myself my grandmother who was the authority in the family at least in that household she did her thing with my older brothers and it was very cruel. She then had to handle me because I found out from the, the gossip amongst the village children that my mother had died. And when I went back to speak to my grand, I went straight back to Granny and I said, you know, is, is my mother dead? And her way of handling that shocked me because it was so cruel. She absolutely refused to look at me or to deal with the question. She just said yes. And continued with her knitting. She didn't even stop her knitting. Wow. That was, that was a real shock. Then a little while later, I heard that my father, who was still in South Wales, was coming up to visit. And I thought to myself, well, good. He's going to tell me what this all means. I didn't know what it meant for the family and for how, you know, what things had changed. How was I expected to change? Anyway, he came up and he, he brushed me off. And at that point, I realized that the adult I was with had no effing clue. Yeah. So I was, I was jerked. Mm -hmm out and to a, a, you might say to an exterior point, but I was jerked out to where I was observing. I didn't have a family, but I observed the adults and I got on fine with my brothers, but the adults I had no respect for. Gotcha. So with you look that, out, of the, out, of that, out of that dynamic, out of that yes. third dynamic, really. So I was I I got used to having a what you might call a spectator viewpoint. I could step out and look. Yeah. So perhaps it wasn't so in, so surprising that I had those happy experiences. But I must say I got to be, get very fond of my grandmother as time went on. She was she was good to me. Good. Uh, anyway. I think the next kind of a spiritual experience was much later as I remember. The next one I think of is I was living in New Jersey. It must have been in the 90s, 1990s. I was out in New Jersey and one Thursday or Friday, it occurred to me to buy the local newspaper, the New Jersey newspaper, the Star Ledger. Okay. So I bought the paper and suddenly I see this ad 
and it's for the Royal Shakespeare Company, and they're performing at the Brooklyn Academy of Music in New York City, and they're performing A Winter's Tale. And the last performance is Saturday. So there were no tickets available, but I went along for the last performance, and of course there was somebody outside holding up a ticket for sale. So I got in, and the play proceeded. It was very, very well done. And in the last act, the, the, the play is about two kings, two men who fall out because one of them goes crazy. Yes. He accuses the other man of seducing his wife. And he accuses his wife of having that man's baby. She's pregnant. And he says that she's carrying it the other guy's baby. Well, it's all a load of rubbish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's Shakespeare and various things happen. And at the, the last act, there's a reconciliation. And uh, you have to wonder how Shakespeare could do it. But everything moves forward towards the final reconciliation. And it's a real reconciliation. It's not theatrical or pretended. It's absolutely real. And as the performance proceeded, uh, I was suddenly not hearing the words. I was receiving the flow, the intention directly. Mm -hmm. And to tell you the truth, is the tears were streaming down my face. I just could not stop them, even if I'd wanted to. But then, after a moment or two, above the actors, and this was a regular stage, with an arch and curtains in the space behind, and they were on the stage, suddenly above their heads, there appeared a huge oval glow. And it was more than golden. It was like golden and alive. Mm. And I'm thinking to myself, what the hell is that? And I figured that it was what Shakespeare had put of himself into that play. Gotcha. Very cool. Yeah. That was that was something else. Well there's another one I remembered. And that was I was living in western Massachusetts, a little town, and I had to go to the laundrette one day. Well I had to go to the laundrette every every week because I didn't have a washing machine. Mm -hmm. But and usually I would go to the laundrette, put my stuff in the washing machine and then go do some errands, come back, put in the dryer, do some errands and come back. But this time I was, it was in between. I had something else to wash. So I went there and I put my stuff in the machine and I took a book to read. And the book was, it was this one, this very copy. You can't see what it says because it's worn. <laughs> it's worn with age. Wow. But you've, it's... <laughs> you've read that quite a bit. You've read yeah. that quite a bit. I remember buying it way back in the 80s in New York. Anyway, it's the Dhammapada, the sayings of the Buddha. And it's a rendering by Thomas Byram. It's published by Shambhala. And I was going to read some of this while I was, while my laundry was in the machine. So I'm, I, I have it and I'm opening it and I'm parking my butt on the chair. And I, it falls open and it happens to fall open at my, one of my most favorite passages. It's one I've quoted last time. And it's called Yourself. And my eye falls on it as I'm parking my butt. So I'm not focusing on the word, but they hit me. 
perhaps because I'm not focusing on words, but as he says, love yourself and watch. Today, tomorrow, always. And that really just, I, I wasn't paying attention, so I was open and it just sank into me. And I'm thinking to myself, how generous that no matter who we are, or where we are, what we're doing or not doing, he's saying it to us, he's giving us permission to love ourselves. And what kind of thing can there be? So I was full of that spirit, and all of a sudden, the whole space of the laundromat was filled with an enormous Buddha face. Wow. A most beautiful Buddha. I think Chinese, very round face with very beautiful eyebrows and eyes and the mouth. Uh, so he was kind of looked, sitting there, or he was being there, or this, whatever it was, was being there looking at me and saying, yeah, you can love yourself. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know what happened. I don't know where it came from or who it was. I'm not saying it was the Buddha. It could have been an implant. I just don't know. We but don't it was, know. We, you know, we're not in so session. Very pleasant. We're not going to find it right now either. But no. um, very, very uh, interesting how these were, these even predate your auditing. This is, these are just you naturally experiencing, yeah. correct? Yeah. Were there other experiences that happened after you started the bridge? Well, the last two, the one with Shakespeare and the one with the Buddha, those, those were well after the I'd left the Zeor. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I'm trying to put the timeline together. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I must have missed that out. That's, a, that's okay. All right. So, well, you did mention New Jersey, which was later in your life. Yes. Yeah. So, um, what about with... Um, well, I didn't want to say something while you were talking. <clears throat> yeah, my TRs went out there a little bit. <laughs> uh, but it was it was something like pay attention to those little like to that you obviously know this, but to, to the world's like pay attention to those little moments. Because we yeah. tend to discount them as just like, okay, whatever. I just had a weird thought, or whatever. But those are kind of like the moments where if you believe in God, God's kind of talking to you. You know what I mean? Where the universe or theta is is saying something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, think you, I do agree. You yeah. tend to agree with that. And we tend to be like, ah, oh, whatever. Or that, you know. But I don't know. That's kind of like a connection to, to truth. Yeah. That we should embrace a little bit more. Because especially as I've gone up the bridge more, especially after my L's. Wow. Um that I've because I've, I got very stable now I was able to perceive more and more of this stuff and it's almost like a gift it's like I'm not trying to create things I'm not trying to whatever I just I'm seeing and observing and accepting these little messages and little beautiful things that, that happen in the world and that's to me having this it's it's, right. a, it's a communication of time and it's wow this world isn't all about this horrible economy and our uh, barely functional <laughs> president, and you know, war, and you know, the Bank of England, you know, those are sure part of it. But in between all that noise, there's beauty, and there's love, and there's aesthetics, and accept those. Yes, I, I think you, I think you're definitely one of the people that accepts those. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Did you observe any kind of, um, you know, continuing on this kind of supernatural bent, uh, anything like that with Ron? Did you observe him doing anything which you can really explain conventionally or uh, like like some people have described, you know, his space seemed very big and he seemed to manifest certain colors or, or whatnot, depending on who you talk to. Have you experienced anything, anything like that with him? Yes. No, I don't. Wouldn't say anything overwhelming. Sure, or really spectacular. Did I tell you about the the time he was talking to me and my attention wandered? 
Uh, and we haven't talked about that here, you know. No. Okay. It was as I was I was the household officer. I was talking to him. He was sitting in his bedroom, and he was sitting down. I was a couple of feet away. He was talking about something I can't remember what, and all of a sudden, my I left. I was thinking about something else entirely. And I was off where I was ever I was off. And suddenly I became aware that there was a finger poking my rib. <laughs> so, of course, I came back and he was sitting in his chair. He was still talking. And he had this smile about him, kind of mischievous smile. But I could... As I came back and was seeing him, I could still uh, the, the 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 last of the tapping on my ribs stopped, but I was in time to notice that his hand, while the tapping was going on, his hand was in his lap, and it was also too far away for him to reach without getting up. Sure. So he took a stained finger and poked you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there was another time yeah. we were on the top floor of the manor. There was a, a very beautiful room in the corner of the manor. It must have been designed specially. And it, I think it was designed for a woman. It was a lovely room. And we were in one corner talking about, I don't know what we were talking about, but he said to me, just take a look around the room. So I took a look around the room. And as I looked, suddenly... It was as though I was looking through a very dirty window. I didn't understand it. I didn't tell him that that had happened. But he just continued his conversation. But in the briefing course lecture that night, he said, if you look through a regular person's, that means somebody's not OT, eyes, it's like looking through a dirty window. Uh, but the the most striking memories I have of him are when he was in a very high tone and that was the most outstanding examples of those were when he was on the ship there was a period in, must have been 71 or 72, when he would come up the stairs to his office after he'd got up and done his solo session. And I would step out of my office to greet him, say good morning, and he would be glowing. And I could see that he obviously had a, had a very good session and a good sleep. And he'd walk into his office and he'd do his in basket, which would come out to me. And then he would, the messenger would say he wants to speak, to, or the commodore wants to speak to you. So I'd go in and he'd be standing. His desk was in that corner over to the right. He'd be standing over in the corner to the left near the fireplace where there was a big mirror over the mantelpiece. And he'd be, I'd walk into the, the, what we call the research room. Why, I don't know, but that's where he had his office. And I'd walk towards him. And as I approached him, I entered a space. It was a very different space. How would you, how would you, describe, how would you describe that, that space? It was very, well, it was not mass space. Hmm. It was his space. It was very light very clear, and he himself, uh, he'd be glowing, almost like gold, and he'd speak to me, he, he would have some instructions or whatever for me, and he'd speak to me very cheerfully, very positively, and very calmly, very relaxed, uh, and then I'd We'd finish that conversation and I'd leave to go and take care of what he told me about 
and I'd step out of that space back into regular space. But it was absolutely wonderful space to be in. Incredible. Absolutely. Incredible. Absolutely. And the other time <clears throat> that I noticed it particularly, something very, very personal about him was that he had a habit, shouldn't call it a habit, maybe a policy, maybe a, it was part of his hat, that he would keep an eye on certain things, like the, the conditions orders, putting people in condition. Sure. Or he'd get the medical reports. The medical officer would send him a daily report every night. Never came through me. I didn't want to see it. But he would notice certain patterns in that kind of thing. The, the people in ethics trouble or people in health trouble or where there was some pattern of situation which indicated to him there might be something technical going on that he should know about and take care of. So in those situations, he would call for the folders of the individuals involved. And he'd go over the folders, and if he found out tech in a majority of those folders, he immediately order, ordered that all of the folders of all of the people being audited on the ship were to come to him for CSN. Wow. So it got very organized. The, the messengers, the, the senior CS would have all the folders ready by about 6.30. Excuse me, mm -hmm. and the messengers would bring them up, and they'd stack him by his desk. And from the floor, the stack might be five feet high. He'd go through all of the folders, and he'd see us. Them. And what he would do in those situations, I don't know quite exactly what his need was. He obviously needed someone to talk to while he was doing it. So he would call me in. And while on the one hand, I loved it. On the other hand, I keep thinking of the mess of papers that are piling up in my desk that have to be handled now. <laughs> and I'm going to be up half the night with this backlog. Anyway, he would he would deal with the folder and he talked to me about he might be talking about who it was the pc we might have something to say about the auditor but he he said mm -hmm. ta up at the examiner just a little bit mm. so he'd go back and he'd look at the session and then he might go back a little further and then he he seemed to have an instinct and all of a sudden, he'd go back and he'd say, there. And he'd, he'd find a major error. And he'd be confident enough to know that that's what he needed to know right now to get this PC back on the rail. So he'd do up, the C, he'd do up a program and write the CF. He might write a cramming order. But that was all done and finished. But while he was doing that and doing the program and writing the CS and the cramming order, he'd be telling me what he was doing and why. And of course, I learned a tremendous amount. I think the what I I was most happy to learn was his attitude to the tech, because it was absolutely one hundred percent kindness. Great point. Great point. And I want to interrupt you there just for a second. <laughs> a lot of critics, what you'll hear is he was a con man who was into money. And I'm like, I've never seen, I mean, he might have been into money, fine. But the con man part, I've never seen anything, but even when he was enforcing ethics anything but a, a, a dedication towards solving the human problem i've never seen a con anywhere 
And right. even when he was mad, it seemed like almost a fatherly, I'm going to spank you because if not, you're going to kill yourself and your brother type of a deal, right? So even there, there's a, there's a bit of a kindness to it. And I don't see that he, with anyone who produced as much work as he did, could have had anything but good intentions and kindness in his heart to do all that. Yes. Yes, I agree. Right. So, you, and you just corroborated that with, with that particular statement of like, you know, his attitude towards the tech was not to punish, not to sec check to degrade people, not to enforce my point of view on, on my PC or decide how that PC is supposed to end up because it doesn't fit my standard. It was kindness towards that being. And yes. he just made that, that clear. It was kind of along with, with exactness about the technology. Yeah. Which is the form of kindness, not being reasonable so that you get the right yeah. result. Yes. Now, I remember make... one time he wrote a cramming, up, a cramming order on an auditor who had rabbited. Okay. That he, 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 instead of handling the PC in the session in that situation, he had, he had rabbited out of it. And he wrote he wrote the cramming order, and the the first thing you saw on the on the cramming order was a large pair of rabbit ears. <laughs> but he did it in such a way that you could see that he wasn't despising the auditor. He was making a point that everybody could chuckle about. Yeah, but still making a very serious point. But uh, generally speaking, when one of the things that made him most delighted was when he had given a difficult CS to an auditor who maybe had been un, unsettled before, and the auditor did the session and produced the result and the report, and it was all perfect. He absolutely loved that. Yeah, it was like it was almost like that's what he lived for. So that's that's one of the the happiest memories I have because it, it happened several times. This whole evolution of pulling in the folders. Yeah, what's um, <clears throat> what's something that you learned just from watching him that maybe isn't fully fleshed out? in an HCOB, like, for example, there's a model session, but when you hear run auditing, there's not, it's not really a strict formal no. thing. But if you were to read the HCOBs, you would be probably even a little bit robotic, which a lot of people are, whereas he was very loose and whatnot. So I'm sure there was some kind of a, a parallel to that while you were watching him CS. Was there some kind of thing you learned or gleaned from that experience, which, which is hard to even express in the ACOB or PL? I guess the kindness okay. is one thing. I mean, it's it's inferred. You can't purposefully work with the rightness of the being if you're not kind. Right. There's no way that would work. Right. But that's the only way auditing does work. Uh, the rest, he was very exact in his perceptions. He didn't I never doubted or I never suspected at any time that he was ever fooling himself about what he was seeing and what he was handling and what he was doing about it. He was honest. Mm. Well, that's that's well expressed everywhere in the text. Agreed. I have to be honest. But... Uh, 
that that degree of honesty is that I saw in him is not usual. We're most of us are tempted to fool ourselves, at least now and then. And I think in other areas he did fool himself in, but with the tech, no. No, he was a virtuoso in applying the tech. And he reveled in his virtuosity when he was CSing those folders. <clears throat> How do we reconcile that the tech kept changing that? Because, for example, he says there's clears uh, in book one. He says, yes. hey, 200 something clears, 200 cases, whatever, whatever it was. Then the 50s continue to make clears, and then help is what makes clears, not book one. And then John McMaster is the first clear all of a sudden. So what What, what the hell? What's a, what's a clear then? If, if you have it in the 50s, then you redefine it, and now this John McMaster guy is the first one. What were those prior people, and how come the, the tech kept changing? Because he keeps saying, this is the way. This is the way you make it clear. Nope, this is the way you make it clear. Nope, now this is really the way you make it clear. And that's kind of the evolution of tech. Like OWs, there's like at least, from my thinking, at least three or four ways to run OW on a, on a, on a pre-clear. Like, and they're and like you started them directly one after the other. So I'm like, which is this is the way you run OWs. No, this is like, so how do we, how do we, Speak to that if you if you would. <laughs> right. what, I, what I just kind of vomited all over the place right there. Okay. <laughs> well, it's it's not something that anyone has ever cleared up, and I certainly can't. He was always the optimist. So if he came across a new kind of concept of clear, that would be it. Uh, the I did hear from people who were on the tech lines towards the end of his life that he had attention on the fact that it was that there was a a need for the tech to be gone through and and clarified. Because there are contradictions, like as you were saying, there are contradictions. Yes. And there are alternatives, and there's some confusion. Yes. But he never, he, it, it was never in, apparently, it was never enough of a priority for him to really make sure it got done. But it needs to be done, still needs to be done. Other than that, I can't really answer your question. Okay. But you, you kind of did. Because okay. I think you did, it, and thank you, because it seems like. Um, and somebody made a, a comment to this. I forget who it was. I'd like to credit him. It just cleared up a little bit for me. That he he had an approach almost like an engineer of like, let's get this to work. Let's get yes. it to work, fix it, and then I don't got enough time to be writing up a dissertation or a thesis. So yes. I think he put all of it as best as he could in some kind of record. Lectures, yes. uh, HOBs, PLs, books, and it was kind of a, as fast as possible because to this day, I don't think of any human being who has ever matched his output. I just, I can't see anyone who's ever given that much. <laughs> no. That many lectures, books, like it's incredible. So you put it all out there. And at one point, I guess, we are supposed to codify it. The danger is that you have something like the Golden Age of Tech, which is Miscavige's attempt at it, which not great because uh, it produced a lot of uh, robotic auditing and, and robotic people. But we do at one point have to figure out a system, and I think it's going to require technology. Oh, yeah. That's going to require, okay, this is OW. Here's all the references in OW. And you study these, you get it. You get it. It's not going to be, okay, we're going to eliminate and tech degrade these issues. No, you're going to have to study them, but here's a, a logical sequence. I guess a better check sheets built on technology is, is going to be the solution. Where we all take that data, we 
compile it in a way where it's all there because every everything you, you glean information from every single issue. But this is the latest way he figured it out is here. You want to know how he got there. Here's some issues earlier and press this and you'll see that, you know, something like that is going to have to happen. Yes. Because as of right now, if you were to say to somebody, okay, we're going to make you a Scientology auditor, I'll say, where the hell do I start? Why is this in this order? At least that, that's for me. I'm like, I want to do the class six just so I get it in order. Because for me to do the academy levels, I'm like, 1968 to 73 to 54, I'm like, I don't like it. <laughs> Because no. he, he had different opinions throughout all those years. Yeah. So you did answer the question. It's up to us to kind of, of somebody in our in the field or a committee or something to kind of figure it out and compile it so that you know the rest of humanity can understand this stuff for the future. Yes. I <laughs> and, agree. I think, and videos like this are gonna help because it kind of explains that it provides even more data. So We'll be part of a check sheet one day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any other things you wanted to mention regarding uh, the supernatural aspect of Scientology or uh, anything you, you've observed <clears throat> before we move on? Well, just briefly, I remember I was at elementary school. I'd returned to South Wales from Scotland. And at Easter, the teacher of the class read the Easter story from the Bible. And he was a gentle old man with a beautiful voice, an old Welshman. And he was reading the story about the crucifixion. And I was listening to him. I was very very attuned to what he was saying because of his voice was so lovely. And I find myself crying my eyes out at what had happened. And it was though I really felt I was crying my eyes out for my friend. What had happened to my friend? Mm. That was very, very clear. Although I didn't know at that particular time I didn't know anything about past lives, although I knew that past lives were possible. Sure. Uh, and then another time, <laughs> when I was had left home, I was I was exploring Christianity, and that was in the Church of England. I belonged to a church where there were a lot of young people, and one of them got married and he invited me to his wedding. And it was a posh wedding out in the country on a hot summer's day in under a big tent and there was iced champagne. I I wasn't a big drinker, but I did drink I drank beer now and again. But this iced champagne was so good. <laughs> I couldn't stop drinking it. And I was wandering about with my glass in my, must have been my 10th glass in my hand, and I came across a group of young girls that I had, were not part of my circle. Mm -hmm. And suddenly um, into this little space came an older lady, an old, and with all due respect, she was obviously an old unmarried lady. She was not attractive. She was kind of dried up. And one of the girls said to her, oh, miss, whatever her name was, can you tell me, tell us how Jesus came to you? And she stopped, and I was looking at her. She was very ugly. And she said, oh, one day Jesus came to me in the bath. And I found this image so disturbing. <laughs> and I felt it was so characteristic of the ignorant Christian that knows what he or she knows because it suits him 
for her. Mm. Had nothing to do with Jesus at all. So I burst into tears. I could not stop crying. And eventually she said to one of the other young fellows that was nearby, she said, take him away. So I was led away. And the next thing I remember, I'm on the train back to London with a horrible headache. But uh, that was an experience that shocked me. I was shocked to have made an exhibition of myself. Mm -hmm. But I was also shocked to see how strongly I felt about how Jesus had been treated, particularly by the Christian church. A bit of, a bit of a disrespect. I think they crucify him every minute of every day. <clears throat> sure. All so, right. Uh, anyway, Keep going, sorry. No, I'm just going to say thank you for letting me tell you about that. Yes. I think, uh, no, these are... This is gold. This is gold. For me, this is all gold. Um, just to be able to share these moments with you, even though we're literally on two different continents right now. Very special, very magical for me. Okay, thank you. So uh, share away. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Have you seen since you've been... Um, because when, when you when you no longer were on directly on his lines, that there was tech or policy alterations which started to happen that concerned you? Speaking broadly, there were changes happening back in the 60s, the later 60s, that concerned me. But more specifically, I think you're talking about maybe the the late 70s and the 80s. Sure. Well, you you talk about the the sixties if you want. Oh, uh, and let's go kind of chronologically. What were the? I mean, I think you already mentioned the ethics stuff that started to come out. Um, but what else did you see in the sixties and, and going forward that concerned you? Uh, I think we spoke about this last time about the policies setting up the guardian's office. Yeah, and the Simon Bolivar policy. We didn't talk about the Simon Bolivar policy. No, was, no, we didn't. We didn't. What was it about that that uh, concerned you? The the last two pages, or the talking? last page and a half, which is what you, yeah, he's saying what you do if you move off a position of power. If you so take all the ammunition uh, you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I could agree that that was that. That's what you should do if you're out in the in the wog world. But to apply that to Scientology didn't make sense to me. Scientology wasn't that world at all. It was a different world. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't know. I, it confused me. I didn't know where he was going. And I thought maybe he was not going in a good direction. And to tell you the truth, apart from the the good things that happened with the tech that I mentioned, uh, I don't think he took Scientology in a good direction. He took the organization and uh, to a bad place. Uh, yeah. Is that from the there were world? technical accomplishments despite all of that, which I think were very good. He He... He had a tech hat that he wore pretty well throughout, despite what the rest of him was doing. What's interesting is that you're the first person um, I think besides myself in, in these interviews. I mean, on, on forums and Facebook groups, people do this all the time. But as far as these interviews, I mean, we're the first that have ever assigned any cause to run himself it's always been somebody altered this hcob or altered his book and they ignored what he really meant but since you were there and i, and I trust your viewpoint because you were literally part in the trenches so to speak uh you can speak honestly that some of the the, the bad changes 
came from the man himself. Yeah. So Simon Bolivar was one. What what else? Um, let's kind of do a timeline here. Oh, yeah. There's another one that really bothered me was this big beings make it go right. And if you're a big being, you can make it go right. If you don't make it go right, you're not a big being. Right. <laughs> a mantra a whole load of bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is the mantra of the Sea Org and every staff member. Oh, I mean, there's even a song. They made a song called Make It Go Right. Um, and it is, yeah, it is an it, if you look at it one side, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, a coach saying, hey, make it go right, let's go, you know, you can do it. But on the other hand, it it, it totally excuses any abuse. Yeah. It's like, you're a moron because you didn't make it go right. Yeah. <laughs> Rice and beans for you, bub. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. Gave people a license to be bullies. Correct. Correct. All right, another but one. In my opinion, <clears throat> the big being... Has it go right? He doesn't make it go right. He has it go right. Mm. If he can. Yeah. Some things sure. you can't control. Sure. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. Next. What else? What else? Let's keep um, talking. There's a good there's a good little run run. Okay. <laughs> I get to I get to moan. He I I disagreed very much with the well, I've even forgotten what it was called. It was a rundown that he developed. The one where he, you put the PC in isolation. The introspection rundown. Introspection rundown. Is that the one? Yeah, it's when, you, when they're type three and they're totally yeah. off. Yeah, it's called the introspection rundown. You basically communicate via notes under the door. Yeah. Yeah. Which was I didn't I didn't like that at all. I thought, well, maybe maybe Hubbard, at his best, could handle a, a very disturbed person that way. But I I very much doubted if there were more than two CSs at the most in the whole world who had the judgment and the skills to manage a com that com line that way. So I disagreed with that. Gotcha. And did, you saw when that was developed, I'm assuming, right? I'm sorry? You saw when that was first developed? Yes. What was the circumstances surrounding that? Was that Susan Meister or somebody else? No, it was not Susan Meister. That was, I forget her name. It was a girl. She was, I think she was a steward or she was on the deck. And... She went a bit bananas. But generally speaking, when he, this is to go off the question a little bit, but it's interesting, I think. When he came across a technical situation that was not resolving with existing technology, he would take it up with the senior CS, and that was mostly with David Mayer. He and Mayer worked well together uh, on the ship I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And he would, they would recognize that there was some kind of situation that the existing tech was not handling. So he would he would try this and try that and see what worked. And eventually... He would he would start a, a structure of action to address this kind of problem. So more people would be, and more pieces would be included in the pilot. Mm -hmm. And as he went, he saw how things were going. He saw what was working, and what wasn't. He he developed what was working, and dropped what didn't work. And eventually they. They came to uh, some kind of format that seemed to be working for everybody or most. And this happened, I think, on, I think the, the first one, if I remember rightly, was the int run there. But there were others. And by that time, he had written up 
the HCLBs, or he had had Mayo write up the HCLBs for his approval. Hmm. And then his, I knew it was coming to an end when he sent an order down to Mayo to say, put together a list of all the mistakes the auditors have made. And Mayo did that, and that would be issued as the correction list for that rundown. Weird. I mean, he might, he might add things, but that yeah. was the basis basis of the correction list. Is there any kind of error that Mayo spotted was compiled in a list? Yes. And that was issued as the... That was the, the correction list for that render. That rundown. Yep. So that was, as you were saying earlier, that was an engineering mindset. Right. Right. Not thoroughly researched, not study group here, so you know, not to uh, a control group and a uh, affected group, whatever. I forget how you call it. Two groups, control group, and the other guys, and then you know, the usual scientific method is more like yeah, yeah. No. the wheel fell off. Let's try duct tape and some nails. Okay, the solution when you when your wheel falls off is duct tape and nails. Just because I ain't got time to really research this, let's move on. <laughs> you know, let's yeah. drive the car. Yeah. yeah. We've okay. got what works. That's all we need. Right. Right. The danger is that then people take that, even if it's just a temporary solution, as a stable data forever. And, then, you know, then they're like, well, no. you always got to use duct tape. Always got to use duct tape. <laughs> even though it's not necessarily true. Okay. So I'm starting to see the character of Scientology change a little bit based on what you're describing. You have that uh, um, really after KSW, 65, things seem to start getting harsher. Uh, and then introspection rundown, um, which again, uh, you know, your viewpoint is that I, I, I agree. I'm like, you have to have Somebody such a delicate state of mind in order to have the introspection run down running them that you really have to have a lot of, like you said, kindness and you have to be on your toes because some yeah. I've kind of experienced crazy people and anything could trigger them. Anything, an, an, an askew glance, you know, a, a loud, like you drop a book and all of a sudden that triggers weird stuff in their head and they, and, they, and they spin so that's a um that can be very scary for them to be isolated locked in a room no contact it can be absolutely terrifying absolutely. so you do need to handle that with kid gloves and you're yeah, probably someone like um the killer H could have pulled it off but not i mean based on what i've seen not eight not even 10 20 percent of the beings on this planet could successfully pull it off very nice especially, especially if you also have a huge workload of other cases that you're handling yeah which is going to be the majority okay beyond that what else let's go chronologically and kind of talk about what else what other kind of alterations or um changes of, were of concern well, I mentioned before that I disagreed with the declaration of SP mindset. Right. <clears throat> I didn't. I didn't think that was workable. I could understand why people should disconnect with this for a while, but he he allowed he encouraged the organization to get into a service fact mode. Yeah. Your SP. And to dump problems that they couldn't, they probably could have handled and should have handled, and said, "No, we're we're not bothering with you anymore. You're you're despised. You're an SP." That isn't Scientology. Although I agree that there is a problem there with handling very difficult people, and that, but that problem hasn't been properly confronted and addressed. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know what to do about it. Offhand, mm -hmm. uh, then the I was kind of interpolated <laughs> in the early seventies 
with all that mess about clear and how it was suddenly there was this confusion I think there always had been some confusion about clear as you mentioned before Yeah, but it was quiet and nobody was bothered about it. Suddenly, everybody's bothered about clear. <laughs> what, 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 what was the genesis of that? How did it spring up? I don't know. Well, <laughs> I, well, I wasn't near him at the time, but there must have, there was there was the the fact that a lot of people it became clear or evident, I should say. Mm. The people were going clear on Dianetics, and he could no longer not is that or not confront it. Uh, so that was an issue. There was the issue about the complexity of the being at the same time that he had to handle. So somebody was somebody was saying, "I'm clear." Well, there was always the question of who's saying I'm clear. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, but I, there was a confusion and I don't think he handled it well. He just made it more confused as far as I'm concerned. But mind you, I, I never sat myself down and went through all of those bulletins about clear in the 70s and the, the clear rundown. I never went through them all and, and got all my misunderstoods and disagreements out. Okay. I'm not really qualified to judge it. Gotcha. Okay, it was just something you observed, that, which is fine. We're not looking for perfection here or, you know, this is my 100% uh, forever opinion. That might even change for you later on. That's fine. Uh, I'm just capturing at the moment. Okay, so clear confusion. I can see how that could be uh, of concern. But this is the, the basic foundation of the entire movement <laughs> period. If you yeah. can't define what you're going for or you keep moving the goalposts, you have an issue. Okay, keep going. What, what after that? <clears throat> uh well I left in eighty two. And there was no particular tech issue for me. It was the way the organization was evolving. And one of the things I find most distasteful, especially amongst the young people coming in and who were at FLAG that I had contact with, and their attitude was, the WAG world sucks. And we are it. And I would hear this, and I'd look at the electric light, and I'd think to myself, the wog world's providing that. Right, like none of you Nimrods could have come up with this. <laughs> Which we alluded to earlier today, right? We were like, the world's... Yeah. Been going on for a long time. Didn't yeah. start in fifty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so I was glad to get away from that. Agreed. Um, what question are we on now? We're basically we we're talking about issues, of alterations, or text, or basically we. My initial question was to find out what other people had altered, but we went right in and what Ron himself had changed and other changes, which we feel have kind of taken Scientology in a, in a bad direction. That's kind right. of it up. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know other people have developed tech, and you can say that's an alteration. Uh, my own attitude towards the, they used to call them the tech finders. My own attitude was, I would look at somebody who's presenting himself or herself 
as a tech finder. And I would compare that being to what I remembered of the beingness of LRH. Mm. I'm not saying that that's a fair comparison to make. But it's one I, I never could help making. And since there was no tech finder that came anywhere near the beingness of LRH, I didn't take very much notice of their new tech. Hmm. There were some things that Alan Walter did that were you know, pretty good. But other than that, I was I was never impressed enough to take it up. So that includes, I'm assuming, the Excalibur by Captain Bill and all that kind of stuff? Uh, I saw something that was put together by Captain Bill and it, it had no interest for me personally. I wasn't going to take it up. Exactly. But I, at the same time, I recognize, I've always recognized that there are many people who say they have followed his bridge and had great gain from it. And my attitude is, if you get great gain, fine, take it. Yeah. But I have no problem with people getting gain. Right. Right, of course. Um, was there tech that is credited to LRH which was really more developed by somebody else and he just signed off on it? Not that I know of. Not that you're aware of? No. Okay. Most, okay. most of the reports I've heard of that kind of thing were long before my time. Okay. All right, so let's talk about your, your later years. So when was the last time you personally um, saw LRH or with LRH and then no uh, longer saw him again after that? What, what was the circumstances uh -huh. behind that? That was quite an event. We were in Clearwater and he had set up a unit in Dunedin, north of Clearwater. We were in a little complex called, uh, called King Arthur's Court, which was some rows of two-story buildings that were flats, apartments. Mm -hmm. And we had a number of those units. And uh, one day, he called me into his office. I, I had just heard that he and Mary Sue were leaving. They were just leaving. And when he left an area, he would generally call me into his office and say, just keep an eye on things. But this time, his mood was very somber. And by this time, uh, things were very cool between us. And he, he, I think he said, you, know, you keep an eye on things. But then something kind of clicked. And he went into, it was like he went into something that he had suppressed. And he looked at me, not in a friendly fashion. And he said, you are too much of a gentleman. So I simply looked at him and I nodded as much as to say, well, I hear you. Anything else you want to say? Any instructions you want to give me? Mm. I don't have anything to say in return. I have no excuses. I think I know what you mean. And But he said no more. I was absolutely amazed because... This was clearly the end of our relationship. And you knew it right there. Oh, yes. <clears throat> but I had always known, quote, unquote, that the end of our relationship would be angry and stormy. I had known for years, I had observed that people who were close to him 
and with whom he had been friends, usually ended up being tossed, being dumped. Red Sharp was one. Reggie Sharp? Yep. And it, it, I, I know from the earlier history that I, did, I didn't directly receive, but he had done the same with other people. And he did a few with a few at St. Hill when I was in the household. So I, I knew that I was close to him. We had a certain friendship. And I knew my time would come. And I expected it would be sudden and very hard. And here he was with all the things that he could accuse me of, justly, of having done to him, all the overts and the withholds that I had from him. He could have wiped me out. But the worst he could come up with was, you're too much of a gentleman. <laughs> it just didn't make sense. Anyway, I thought at the time he was referring to the fact that um, I would respond. Uh, when reports came to him, I would write a response for him to okay or not okay or change or do whatever he wanted. It was part of my hat to write that up for him. Mm. So that the reports would come in from the, the I forget what they were called, the senior people in the flag bureau who are responsible for the international stats. They would send a report each week about the international stats and what they were doing. The AIDS? Huh? No, the Commodore AIDS? No. AIDS. no. Oh. The Commodore AIDS were his staff. They were part of his office. There okay. was another organization called the flag bureau. Okay. And they did the international organization. Okay, gotcha, yeah. So. Right. So they, the, the seniors in that organization would send their weekly report with the stats for him to see. And I would always write an acknowledgement for them, including maybe some instruction. And I thought to myself when he said that, he must be referring to the fact that I was never hard enough. I, was, I did never hit them brutally. But many years later, I remembered something, and I think this is what it was. We were on the ship coming across the Atlantic to move. We were moving operations from the European side, and we were going to the American side. And we were making for Charlestown. Is it Charlestown, I think? A port in... North Carolina. I think it's Charleston. Or Charleston. 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 Okay. <clears throat> and we were well over halfway there. I think we might be arriving in the next couple of days. And suddenly there's this big kerfluffle. Jane Camber has managed to find a way to get the radio phone on the ship, on the bridge. And she has, mess she has reported to Mary Sue that the FBI and various other people are in Charleston waiting for the ship to arrive. And the obvious implication is they're going to grab L. Ron Hubbard. So, of course, we have to go somewhere else. So there's a group of us. He's, he's on the, the top landing of the outsider's office. Mary Sue is beside him. I'm over here by my office, and there are various aides around the, the stair stairwell. And he is, he's trying to figure out where did we go. So I was, I think I was the first one to make a suggestion. And I, I was suggesting that we go, I was going to suggest my whole suggestion was that we just tell Charleston we're going to Newfoundland. But then instead, we go south to the Caribbean. And when I said we go north, we tell them we're going north 
to Newfoundland, the, there was a guy standing right next to Mary Sue, who was a senior officer, and he saw a Chinese. And his immediate reaction to what I was saying, he interrupted what I was saying, and he's, he, he said, nah. And he sounded so much like a donkey <laughs> braying into Mer poor Mary Sue's ears. <laughs> I was utterly shocked that he could do that. <laughs> I stepped back. <clears throat> I mean, he really took me by surprise. Being so absolutely vulgar. And I noticed that as I stepped back, LRH, who was looking more or less straight ahead, he inclined, he, he looked out of the side of his eye, not at me, but close to me, and he was observing that I'd stepped back. Instead of ripping that guy's face off, which is what LRH probably would have done. I should have made it go right. So I think... That's what he was referring to when he said I was too much of a gentleman. He was saying I was too sensitive. Yeah. Which is true. Yeah. So that was the last time I saw him. When was that? What year was that? If you can remember. That must have been 75. 1975. Was it 75? Wait. Well, it was the... It must have been either the year that we left the ship and came ashore or the next year. I can't remember which year it was or which month. Okay. But it, I think it was early in the year. It was not long since Christmas or New Year's, I believe. Okay. All right, so he says, you're too much of a gentleman. You act him, I'm assuming, and back out of there, and that was it. That was it. Yeah. I was not, he, he didn't cause me any further trouble until I shoved something in his face that he didn't want. Which was? Uh, it was after the big raid in L.A. And then Mary Sue and the other people got charged. I was in Clearwater. He was out in California. I didn't know where he was. And he sent me a, an order telling me to put together for him a pack of orders that he had issued, or anything he had issued, flag order or policy, which forbade what Mary Sue and the others were charged with doing. And I was kind of disgusted because he was telling me, what he was saying to me was, cover my ass. Right. I did not like that at all. But I sent what I could find, which wasn't very much, but it... it would have covered his ass. And then I got really, really, my knickers got twisted. When he sent an order down to the LRHPR, who was in, I was in charge of the personal office. So those orders would come through me. And she, he told her that on no account was there to be any press release in his name concerning Mary Sue Hubbard. And I, this, of course, there might have been some, I mean, there was obviously good PR reason for it, but. I, I really didn't think that this man had the slightest ethical or moral reason to declare to the world that he was throwing his wife under the bus. Right. 
<clears throat> and especially Mary Sue, because he would have been nowhere near where he got to without her. And I sat, well, of course I passed the order on, and I sat on this very uncomfortably and very unhappily for days. Then I said to myself, I'll solve this problem. I will, I will force the PR to write up a press release uh, supporting him, support, with him supporting his wife. And we'll just put it in a file and forget about it. Not that that would really make any difference to anything, but I could live with it a little more easily. Uh, so I did that, and she wrote one up. And she addressed it. She wrote it up, and she, I, I don't know why she did that, but and I never asked her. It doesn't really matter. But she had she addressed it as a proposal to LRH. <laughs> kept via me <laughs> so I got it and I thought why not really <laughs> so I put it in the basket to go to him wow and that caused a lot of trouble poor poor Liz she got sex checked and found to be a list one RS and put in the RPF then I got sex checked and I found out later that the, the guy who audited me on the sector uh, said, first of all, he reported that he found an RS. And then immediately after he'd put the folder in, he said, no, it was not an RS. But then, I, then reportedly, the, the, the Clearwater CMO person in charge said it doesn't matter. For what he's done, he's going to the RPF anyway. Uh, so I was put in the RPF. That didn't worry me. Well, that whole operation, there was an operation in progress where people, it was he was looking for people at FLAG who were RSing. So they'd be taken off the line and put in the RPF. And the CMO at Clearwater was in charge of this project. And they had the help of a technical person whom I may or may not name. Anyway, this technical person had a record as a troublemaker. He would get into an area and after a while, there'd just be trouble. Mm. It was known. But he was in charge of this project. Anyway, uh, I knew after the sack check, I knew something was happening. I could feel something was coming over the hill. And I remember I went to David Mayer, who was still in Clearwater at the time, and I said, you know, something's going on. And uh, he mentioned to me that that technical person they had in charge of the this project, I, I said to David, May I, I'm sure they think I have an RS. And it, he didn't really address that. Well, I guess he couldn't. He couldn't tell me I'm not an RS because that's, you know, it's case data. He's the CS. Right. <laughs> but uh, he did say, he went so far as to tell, say to me that this person, this technical person working with the CMO, he says he has a list of RSs as long as your arm. <laughs> God. And you put anyway, that guy, that guy in charge of that. Uh, <laughs> okay. So it, it took them, I knew what was coming. But there was just, there was nothing happened for days. So I knew they were trying to figure out how to how to make it okay with everybody that Earth was going to the RPF. And this is about seventy eight we're talking about. I'm assuming uh, seventy, probably early seventy eight. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, they were trying to figure how to make it all right, how to do it in a, a good PR way for them, how to make me wrong enough. So eventually, they figured it all out. And I'm sitting in my office one day, and suddenly the door opens, and in, walk, in walks this tech terminal. And behind them, a long line of people who line up. I had a big office in the Clearwater place. They're, they're, they're lined up along the wall. And he comes over to my desk. He sits down in front of my desk and hands me a handwritten flag order, flag conditions order. It's assigning me to the RPF. I'm reading it because he's given it to me. And it's very hard to make sense of. It's handwritten in a very childish hand. And it's not very intelligible. And it certainly isn't intelligent. So I'm reading this. And I'm trying to make sense of it. And I read it again. And eventually, I just give up. And I say, OK, I'm ready. So I'm led out. and. There begins my RPF adventure. I was very interbulated. But I must say the people in the RPF, they were lovely. The person who was in charge, the RPF in charge at the time, Sandra Johnson, she had been staff captain and an aide. And she personally took me down to Clearwater, down to the water's edge at Clearwater that first day. And she, you know, she just talked to me and let me talk to her. And the, the other people in the RPF, they were very kind. They just didn't stare at me or they didn't do this or anything. They just accepted that I was there. However, I was extremely interbulated. And regardless of that, they were taking care of my what they thought was my bypass charge, I was audited regularly, L1Cs and all that stuff. And I, then I suddenly realized, I said, this is, I don't need an L1C, I need an L7. That's the correction list for the clearing course. I can see that, I need that. And it took them a few days, but eventually Glenn Samuel, who was uh, one of the CSs in the RPF and an advanced course CS, he took it up. And I, no, he gave me the session. He did the L7 on me. And then I, I spotted what the charge was. It was not mine. It was the charge of the person, the tech person who was in charge that had me put in the RPF. He had he had a dichotomy screwed around. Wow. And I picked it up. Wow. I was just fine after that. Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> anyway, the next the next interesting thing on that, that adventure was I was in the RPA. There was hundred and twenty five of us. And the flag up. hundred and twenty five. Yes, people. all RSers. This is elevated order. Like he wanted yes. it done. Okay. Yes. We were cleared off the lines because we were RSing downstairs. <laughs> and we lived in the garage. The spiral concrete garage. <laughs> well, one about about three or four days in, we all mustered on the third floor. And we mustered, and out of the door to, into the main building comes this guy and a few other people from the CMO. And he has an important announcement for us. And he said, there's an amnesty from LRH. And that the, the conditions are these. Anybody in the RPF who wants to leave can leave now with no freeloader bill. Jeez, pretty good oh. offer. <laughs> oh, that suits me just fine. And I'm thinking, well, what if I put up my hand? Uh, several people put up their hand. 
And I thought to myself, no, this is an LRH trap. Trick, yeah. <laughs> and it's aimed very specifically at me. It had, I knew LRH, and this had LRH's fingerprints all over it. Because if I had accepted this so called amnesty, I would have been sex checked, probably to the point of insanity. But it would have allowed him to say, I have found the international who uh, of Hedna Scientology. Hedna Pike. The Hannah Pike. Yeah, the big Hannah Pike. <laughs> yeah. So I thought to myself, oh, no, you don't. I'm not handing you that goal. So I kept my hand down. Oh, I guess he was somewhat impressed. I continued in the RPF. Well, my attitude was that I was never in the RPF. I was in the RPF, yes, but I myself, I was never in it. I couldn't get in it. Not me, not me myself. Mm -hmm. But I was going along with it. I had, you know, one of the reasons... One of the reasons I accepted the assignment was, first of all, well, I was away from these stupid exec admin lines, which were unbearable. And secondly, it gave me the opportunity to get back into tech. Mm. So fortunately, I was allowed to become the RPF, well, kind of review auditor. Okay. So that gave me experience. I hadn't had a lot of tech training before. I did start tech training at St. Hill, but it didn't get very far. But uh, anyway, I was doing that and getting along okay. I wasn't in any great trouble. And then one day I was, I think I was on night duty. Somebody had to be there at night somebody to receive anything or to, you know, like a, a watchman. Sure. And one day, Pat Broker came by. One night, I should say. Pat Broker came by and he said, I thought you'd like to know. Now, Pat Broker was a big thing. a big, He was a big noise by then. Why, I could never, ever understand. Anyway, he was a big noise. And he came out and he said, I just wanted, thought you'd like to know that somebody around LRH had said to him quite recently, said about me, he's not a Sea Org member. And LRH replied, he is a Sea Org member. So I was guessing that he had said that because I kept my hand down. I hadn't taken the amnesty. Mm. Now there was there was something about my not being a Sea Org member in the flag order that they had cobbled together. But when I, with that order that was shoved under my face in my office, that didn't make sense. There was an LRH um, monograph, mono what you call it, his thing that he signed things with to say that he approved them or or not approved them. I've forgotten what it is, what they call it. Anyway, I could see that that was a forgery. <clears throat> but I said nothing. Wasn't going to make any difference. What what clued you into that it was a forgery? Is that just a stamp? Or... No. It was handwritten. But it was obviously not handwritten by... I mean, I'd seen that thing a uh, thousand okay. times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and this yeah. was a child's attempt. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, I, I lost track of where I was. Well, a little bit of RPF. Just a question. Oh did yeah. You, did you ever find it ironic that you ended up on this thing that you had literally created? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, there was there was when I first was there, they were so friendly. I mean, they they made it real easy for me. 
They really looked after me, but really nicely. That's good. And there was one nice thing that I kept hearing. Before I was put in the RPF, the, the, the RPF was given an assignment to clean the swimming pool in the grounds of the Port Harrison. They did, and they did a really nice job of it. So I wrote down to the RPF and I said, you have my permission if you want to, to get up early in the morning and ha have half an hour in the pool. And they decided that they, it wasn't quite appropriate for the RPF to be enjoying themselves <laughs> that way. But so, they... Pina coladas and... <laughs> <laughs> but they acknowledged me by saying that Strangely enough, he said, if, if ever you were assigned to the RPF, you are forgiven 100 laps. <laughs> did you ever take that offer up or did you ever? I don't know that, that I was ever assigned any lap. Okay. <laughs> I could have been. I could have been. I, well, sometimes I should have been. There was. A, I was out doing the night thing one evening and out comes the staff not CS, who's not in the RPF. He's been through the RPF. Anyway, this is a fellow I've known since St. Hill, and I don't have a lot of time for him. No, I don't dislike him, but, you know, he's just, he's in his own league, and he should have stayed there. Mm. Anyway, he comes out, and he's talking to me about something, and I am very deliberately, I, I cannot bring myself to call him sir. I just cannot do it, and I don't. <laughs> and of course, being who he was, he reports me to ethics. But uh, perhaps because of who he was, ethics took no notice. Okay. <laughs> but I should have done laps for that. Gotcha. Uh, I was going to say that... If you like, I could tell you about the contract thing, because there is a story behind that, the Sea Org contract. Yeah. Okay. We go back to 1968. Uh, I had just written to... I was LRH Com St. Hill at that time. I'd written to him. So I thought I'd just... would be the decent thing to do, since we had been friendly, to let him know that my staff contract was up. And I was going to leave. And I was going back to see what I could do with a career in music. Okay. I didn't know this. That, got to, that, that dispatch got to him and he sent it back with a response. And the response was, well, I could go back to my writing career. No surf fact there. <laughs> yeah. So that really didn't do anything for me because my immediate thought was, well, you had a writing career and you left it. I didn't have one yet. Mm. So what you're saying is not fair. Mm. Anyway, I was continuing to plan to leave and then suddenly in July of 68, he reorganizes worldwide. The worldwide was, in those days, the topmost executive level of the international orgs. And they operated out of St. Hill Manor. The LRH Com Worldwide was part of that. That was Ken Delderfield, who was a good guy. Okay. And Delderfield had been called to the ship and been trained up on this, that, and the other. And then he was sent back to Worldwide, and Exec Council Worldwide was reformed. He was the chairman of, of Exec Council Worldwide, and LRH appointed me as the new HCO Exec Sec Worldwide. And then Alan Ferguson was the new Org Exec Sec Worldwide, and Tony Dunleavy was the new public, new Division Six. Now, the public division exec set. And that was, that was just 
pure hell from start to finish, day by day. And there's a whole lot, lot of stories I can tell you about that. But there came a point where there were, there were more than one mission from the Sea Org to Worldwide. None of them targeted at me particularly. But one day, one of the missions that was run by Hank Larhus, a Dutchman, a nice guy, and he showed me a telex that he had received from LRH. And it said, very curtly, send Irk to flag quietly. And I looked at this and I thought to myself, he's obviously going to do away with me. I'm going to call me to the ship. Nobody's going to know I'm there. And he's going to throw me overboard with a with an anchor on my leg. <laughs> Why else would he want me to go there quietly? So I was so curious. I said, okay, I'll go. So I went to the ship. I arrived. They were in Corfu. And I was taken to Department 1 personnel. And I was received by Alex Zabersky, who put me on a new recruit routing form. Okay. I said nothing because as far as I knew, I was already in deep trouble. So why should I invite any more? So I go on this <clears throat> routing form, but I'm interrupted because Irene Dunleavy no, I think she was Irene Howie by that time. She had a, a special project for me to do. Or she had a project, project to get done, and she chose me to do it. So I was hauled off, and I had to do this project. The project was to put together, I think, 21 packs of Xeroxes of documents that were to be sent to various police authorities around the world. And this was to prove that mental health was in the hands of Smirsh. Smirsh, that's correct. <laughs> and a very amateurish, uh, you, I mean, it was just so silly. Okay. That was kind of dirty and untidy. And... Anyway, I put them all together, and then immediately I'm on a different project. And this is to write up an, an index a policy. <laughs> I really, I did start and I was doing what I thought was an index, but it wasn't really an index. They forgot to help me on what an index is and how to do one. I mean, there's a tech for that, very specific tech. And it didn't occur to me or to them that I sh should find out what it was. <laughs> anyway, um, I hear nothing about a contract, and I'm not thinking about a contract. I become LRHCOM flag, no, LRHCOM Apollo. So I'm LRHCOM for the, the ship org, and I'm real busy because I have the engineering department 21, engineers, the engine room. Yeah. And I have the ship's captain, who's a very busy guy. We have various adventures, which I can get in, interesting adventures, which I can get into at some other time. Anyway, until 1971, I think it was, I did, the, the, the thing about a contract didn't occur to me or anybody else. But I had found out early on that the billionaire thing had been originated by the AIDS at the time and then approved by LRH. Now, I didn't agree with the, the billionaire contract. I didn't want to sign one because I didn't see any sense. I didn't see the slightest bit of sense in assigning somebody else the right to tell me what to do for a billion a year. I mean, it's just it was stupid. So anyway. And that was not LRH's idea. That was the It was not LRH's idea. Okay. <clears throat> it was suggested to him, and I assumed it was this, it was presented to him out of what I would call propitiation. Hmm. Anyway, they wanted to make him feel good. They wanted to make themselves look good. 
So this, they came up with this idea, and he accepted it. Okay. Nothing to do with anything, but taken very seriously. I didn't take it seriously. And the seventy one, um, there was a, a personnel shakeup. People were appointed to different posts and moved around. And who should become head of department? One, but Quentin. Now, I thought this was kind of. I thought the little bit of judgment lacking here because Quentin was known to be a gossip. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. And what's in department, 20, department one are all the staff or the crew files. Right. All the ethics folders <clears throat> and personnel folders. <clears throat> personnel folders. So I'm thinking to myself, whose folder is Quentin going to go for first? Quentin and I, we were okay, but we were not friends. And I, I sometimes, I, I got on the wrong side of him because he would be making a noise near the Commodore's office and I'd tell him to be quiet. Well, I'd ask him. I wouldn't be rude. I'd just tell him, you know, you need to be quiet or go right. somewhere else. And he didn't take that well. So I wasn't worried about, I wasn't even thinking about the contract. I didn't care. I had no concern about a contract, signed or not. But uh, I knew he'd go for that for my folder. And I knew also <laughs> that if, well, let, let's go, let's not jump ahead. So the, within a day or two, I get a little dispatch from Quentin saying, oh, I just happened to notice that there's no contract in your file. Just happened, of course. Mm -hmm. So, and attached to the contract for you to sign. A billion year contract. A billion year contract. And okay. my first thought is, I'm just going to ignore it. But then I had to think better of that because I had to remember that <laughs> Quentin had the practice of going to speak to his mother most evenings. And they chat. And I, you didn't need to be very intelligent to know that if Quentin found out that I was not willing, I, there was no contract on file, and I wasn't willing to sign one, who'd be the next person to know? And after her, who'd be the next person to know? Right. So I signed the stupid thing and sent it back. That's how I, but I didn't mention it to one person. I mean, I wasn't worried one way or the other, but something came up when I was talking to one of the personal office staff, and it's, I mentioned that I'd never signed a, a contract when I, well, I don't think I said that, but I think when I first came aboard, I hadn't signed a contract. And it didn't occur to me, I mean, we were just chatting personally, didn't occur to me that I should answer the next obvious question. Yes, I did sign a contract later. I just left it. So there was there was a a few people who had that little bit of gossip. She she shared it with a few people, and it got to be known. So that was one of the things I was accused of in this FCO assigning me to the RPF. What, what what was the specific charge? Uh, I don't remember. Like insubordination or failure to follow policy or No, I can't remember. Yeah. It okay. was it was all just too childish. Yeah. For me to take much notice of. There was a a later, a more more credible SP order came out because there was one of the personal office staff got declared and she left. And I got in touch with her and I was trying to get her back in. Hmm. God knows why, because I was already halfway out myself. I don't know what I was doing. I was crazy. Yeah, do I was crazy when I left. 
Uh, we're, we have a lot more to ask. Good. A lot more. Like I'm, I think we're gonna have, uh, if you're willing, at least two or three more conversations like today's. Just sure. The amount of of questions, uh, and I don't want to tire you out. I want I want to end off at a good point. So, I think if you can, at least today, I want to go into the RPF and all that kind of stuff later. Um, but just today. Did you just mention it already that you were kind of crazy when you left? What were the circumstances regarding your leaving? Um, how did that come about? And then we'll end off and we'll continue to ask uh, more questions next time because I have a lot to ask about Mayo, Broker, as you've already mentioned, and a couple of other things. And we still have a bunch of viewer questions, a lot of stuff people want to know that we haven't even touched. So for today, we're going to end off with you kind of explaining that your mental state when you left, what were the circumstances re regarding you leaving, uh, and your declaration, and then we'll end off there, and then we'll pick it up uh, in our next scheduled time. Okay, okay. All right. Fine by me. Okay. Uh, okay, leaving. I came out of the RPF. After how long? Oh, maybe... Around a year, maybe. Okay. Or maybe it even lasts. I can't remember. I'm okay. not good on dates, That's usually. But I was taken out in order to be trained up to be a DFP for interviews in the Knots HGC at Flaherty. They had the D regular DFP. They had another DFP for interviews. And that line was so heavily used, they needed another one. But I was chosen. And I took that up that job. And while I was on it, I was training up the, the lower levels, up to class four, and doing internships. So I became an, uh, a full class four. Then I was replaced as an interviewer and put on the NOTS auditor training. So I became a trained NOTS auditor. <laughs> I'm very. There was a there was huge demand for knots at that time, and they put me on auditing public, which was kind of crazy because you know I was, I I didn't have the experience. You need experience being in the chair to know how to you learn how to deal with all these things, and I didn't have the experience, and I was in cramming every every other day. But I was learning. Yeah. And I stuck to it. And I was winning. And after a while, like, I wasn't in cramming so much. Then in my second year as a full-time knots auditor, things just came together. And I was flying. And I was, I found myself good enough <laughs> to be doing 40-hour weeks. Wow. And more. A well done, not auditing hour. Week after week after week. So that did a great deal for my self respect. Huge amount. And that fulfilled a goal I'd always had to see if I could prove myself as an auditor. Mm -hmm. And it's incidental, but very indicative that during the, the personnel purges of the prior couple of years, a lot of senior execs had come out of the Flag Bureau and other places, and they'd, they'd ended up in the HGC being auditors. And the word was, the word I heard was that in the CMO Clearwater, the they were saying that the HGC was a clinic for failed executives. And I needn't tell you what that what I thought about that opinion. Yeah. yeah. Degrading. Degrading. <clears throat> it was degrading for them, not for us. 
Uh, so I was doing very well. There was a good deal of interpolation in, of internal thermodynamic interpolation. You just get fed up with the the CO is pushing this, and the org officer is pushing that, and the the org exec is pushing the other. Then there's the there's the product officer, and there's the ESTO, the org officer, there's the DOP. They just won't leave you alone. Yep. <laughs> So you you get in session partly to escape all that stupidness, and the tech pages, boy, were they bastard! I hated them. Or oh, should say, I hated the way they behaved. Mm. Anyway, and then there was the interpolation of I'd go to bed, I'd go to my room at ten by ten o'clock if I was lucky, knock on the door. There's an all hands, <laughs> yeah. stuffing letters, <laughs> a mail out or whatever. Yeah. And I would say, well, look, I'm auditing. I have to start at 9 o'clock. And these people are paying nearly a 1,000 pounds. No, I think it was $1,200 an hour. Do you think they want a sleepy auditor? You've got to come down. It's an all hand. So we would have that fight regularly. And I don't think I ever went down. But that was going on. And I, you, know, you get fed up with that, working in that atmosphere. And then I'm thinking, I'm getting on. I'm in my 40s, late 40s. I'm going to get to the point where I can't work anymore. What are these young people going to do with us old guys that can't work anymore? What's going to They're going to be in charge. Whatever they meet out, we've got to accept. Yeah. And I could see me in a, a hut, in a dormitory, with all these other gray old guys wondering what the hell we're going to do. I thought, no, it's not for me. So I determined to leave. Now, I was very aware that as personal communicator, I had had a certain amount of status as a stable terminal. I was there for a number of years. And I was officially the court of last appeal in ethics. And I made sure if anybody appealed to me that I was just. <clears throat> sure. If the ethics gradient was wrong or I too much or whatever, I would fix it. I never compromised on that. Although I must say I went overboard myself with conditions now and then. Sometimes you had to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm thinking to myself, I don't want anybody to be destabilized by the fact that I'm leaving. That would be anybody from the ship because there were tons of people in, in Clearwater that had no clue who I was. Who you were, you're right. Or had been. So I said, if they want to leave, that's up to them, and they should do it on their own determinism and not be influenced by what I'm doing. So I concocted a scheme whereby I would ask for leave of absence, extended leave of absence, for a year. And I was open. I did ex apply for it. I said, I'm considering what I do with the rest of my life. And if I decide that I don't want to rejoin Scientology, I'll come back and say so. That was reduced to three months. But just as I was finishing my arrangements to leave, that is, I was opening the door to get out, the new RTC arrived. And here was hell. The the tech people were mustered on the day they arrived or the next day. We were all mustered in a certain room. I forget what it was called. And I, following my usual practice, I kind of drift to the back of the room. 
and Jeff Walker tells me very sternly to stay in the front. I knew something was up. So in comes two of the RTC people. One of them was the girl from Texas. I've forgotten her name. Very severe woman. Vicky and, Asmaran, whatever. Yeah, Vicky Asmaran. Yeah. And she lectures the, the, the assembled tech people about this and that and the other, how wrong we all are and the lazy. I forget what. It was just, you know, it's so unpleasant. You're just being an asshole. Anyway, she finishes that and then she turns to me. She says, you, you're disaffected. And she said, something like, you could clean up your OW." That's up to you. You decide. So, and she ends the meeting. And I go, it was, it was uh, dinner time. I went and had dinner and I went back to my room and I thought, well, I'm going. Here it is. So, I get ready. I mean, I start getting ready to I start packing. And there's a knock at the door, and there is a guy who is, he is the, the page for the senior CS at that time, Ray Mithoff. Mithoff. And he says, I think he wants to know if I'm going or staying. And I said, I'm going. So he runs off, and he comes back. No, excuse me. There was a development before that. After dinner, I was called down by this guy, this page, into the garage on the ground floor at the back, where it was very dark. And I find myself surrounded by five big guys. One of them is I'm, I'm going to name him because he deserves to be known. He was Steve Wright. And Steve Wright lets go at me with a barrage of accusations and abuse. Nothing particularly upsetting. I mean, not, none of it made sense. So, you know, mm -hmm. just water off a duck's mouth. What else can you expect from these people? But then he spits on my face. Oof. And I'm thinking, I, I have to hit him. But then the, the other four big guys get closer. So I just said, no, I'm not going to hit him. I'm just going to take it. Dang. So I took it. And then we, I was dismissed, went back to my room, washed my face immediately, and continued. And then there's another knock at the door, and there's this page again. And he says, you can have your sack checked. And I'm thinking to myself, I didn't ask for any sack check. I don't need or want a sack check, but if they're pushing me in that direction, I'll go. So I said, okay. Then he comes back, if I'm continue packing, because I'm leaving the room anyway now. And he comes back and he says, you'll have to be with the RPF. He says, you're not in the RPF. He's not assigning me to the RPF, but I have to be with the RPF. So I, I'm not worried. Okay, so I'm with the RPF. And then we, I find out that the RPF is on a special assignment. And they're renovating a certain space in the Fort Harrison. And they're doing it at night. So I'm with the RPF all night. I finally get to a bunk somewhere. And I'm woken up so I can be sector. And I'm sector by an outer org trainee was not a very, you wouldn't call him a very high power character. Mm. 
So he's not happy. He's obviously very unhappy at the situation he's in. And he keeps getting reads. And I keep saying, well, for fuck's sake, I'm tired. I haven't slept. I'm protesting. Yep. You shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be doing this at all. Dow tech. Dow tech. tech. So, and the sec check was all about how I was connected to 10 executives that were just being come out for rebellion. Apparently, they had decided that something or other was not right and they were going to change it. And that meant changing LRH's mind about something. Mm -hmm. I think it was the 10% monthly increases, I think. Anyway, they were sure, the, the RTC were sure that I was involved with all these people because I knew them. I knew every one of them. But the, the sector what didn't reveal anything, and eventually they gave up. Because it was, I, I was continually up all night with the RPF and then being sector over no sleep. And there wasn't anything on the questions anyway, so they just gave up. And one day I was called, I was having a meal with the RPF and the a messenger came in and the, the bosun who was um, Irene Howie, she stood up and she said, Urquhart and Friedman must go to to the Vicky Asenran. I forget what, exactly what she said, but we had to go to that mission. And Vicky Asenran looked at Frankie Friedman and said, you, you're declared SP. Pack your bags and leave this base. And then she turned to me and she said, you, pack your bags and leave this base. Well, I hadn't been declared. And she didn't say I was. Which was a bit confusing, but I wasn't staying around to find out what that was all about. I was happy to be on my way. Yeah. I was free. That's how I live. Yeah, I can imagine because uh, I've I've done it. Let's say I routed out twice. Oh yes. And then also leaving the ITO um, on Hollywood Boulevard was also another one of those moments. The three basic exteriorizations from the from the group, where it was just like, this is life. <laughs> What I just left was this compacted cell of insanity. So I can imagine for you having been stuck there forever in much worse situations than I was. Because I mean, my situations were harsh, but nothing like having to deal with Vicky Asnaran. I mean, Jesus Christ. Um, or getting spit at in your face. I mean, just horror. So I can relate to that. I can, I can imagine once you well, well, tell me what was it like once you like left the actual building. What were you thinking? What did you feel? What was that like? It actually took me about three days. I was still in Clearwater because I had belongings still in the in Clearwater, and that was partly because there was a guy there who had a workshop and he very kindly put my, I had, a, I had a couple of trunks and boxes and so on. I had quite a bit of stuff and he kindly hid them in his workshop mm. for me. And uh, it took me a little while to arrange my transport. Somebody put me up very kindly, but I had to arrange transport and so on and it, but it all worked out. I had no trouble getting my things out from that space. I won't mention his name because he might he might still be alive and he was still in a few years ago. But he was real kind. He was very supportive. Uh, I was I was numb mostly. I was relieved, but I was also numb. As I say, the well, I, I before I left, 
when it was known that I was thinking of leaving, that I was disaffected, then some other page or some other CS was doing an ethics action on me and interrogating me. And that, I don't, I don't know that that drove me around the bend, but that drove me into places where I was real confused. But my underlying confusion was coming up. And I really was. I went weird with him. Mm. I didn't know I didn't know what I was doing or saying. And he was he was not understanding. So I was mentally in a very bad place. And I was I knew that I was going to return to England. And I knew that unemployment in England or in the UK at that time was enormous, like 20% in some areas. Wow. And I had this period of time where I'd done very specialized work, but I couldn't explain it to anybody. Right. Who would know what I was talking about? Nobody. Right. So I was kind of scared. How would I? Because the the UK is very cold about down stats. I think America is much friendlier. They give you a chance. But in in England, if you're not, if you're down, you they don't really give you much of a hand. Mm. So I was scared. But I went, I went home to my father and stepmother for a while, and then I was offered a position in the States. So I came back and didn't leave. And what would you say your life has been since leaving Scientology? Just what have you been doing? Writing, just general work? What has your life been like since then? Mostly, I've done, I was a traveling auditor. Okay. And I, the first, at first I was doing mostly not, I did not for years, but then there were the other levels. People were demanding the other levels. So I was doing other levels as well. So you still made your living within the Scientology world, just in the field. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. When I first left, it never occurred to me that I could audit outside the church, especially not. But then I was, I was working with the, the the very kind person that had brought me back to the states from the UK. That was not working out well. And then I got a call from David Mayo saying, "I'm setting up a center in Santa Barbara. Would you like to come over and audit?" And I was over there at once. All right, let's end off here, and we're going to pick up our next interview right at that moment with the with the AAC okay, in Santa Barbara. All right, are you feeling okay with all this? Are you feeling good? Yeah, it's it's, it's I think it's good fun. It's a little bit cathartic, maybe to vocalize it because I know your 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 writing is incredible. Like you have a, a command of the English language. It's like. Uh, I, I'm pretty smart, but I have to go to the dictionary with your writing sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you have a, a, a great um, uh, command of the language. But I think um, maybe verbalizing is also fun for you. <laughs> it's fun for yeah. me. <laughs> Communication is fun. Yeah. But I don't have much opportunity to be talking about these kinds of things with anybody. There's nobody around here. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Well... Um, hopefully, uh, this is this is going to continue to be fun. We have lots more to to cover, and like I said, um, maybe somebody will make this as part of the check sheet of like Scientology. What went wrong? Look at this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Lessons to learn. Lessons to learn. There's valuable. There's a, there's a lot of lessons to learn here. Okay, so that's going to be all for today. Is there anything you want to say before we end off here? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It, again, it's a pleasure. And I'll see you on Monday. Very good. All right. Take care, sir. Bye-bye now.